इधर स्टार्ट है ओम सहना वबतु सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर करवा वह तेजस्वीनावधी तमस्तु माँ विदिशा वह ही ओम शांति 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 ही हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु साउंड थोड़ा कम है अच्छा तो साउंड मैंने तो अपना फुल रखा हुआ है आप अपनी तरफ देखो कि उसको कुछ एवरीबडी एल्स ऑल्सो फीलिंग दैट वे अबाउट द साउंड दैट मीन्स आपके आपका थोड़ा हाई करो या मेक योर्स लिटिल हायर ऑन योर साइड जो ट्राई दैट ओके सो एज जो मैंशन दैट वी आर डूइंग वी आर स्टार्टिंग चैप्टर फोर and each chapter has its own beauty of course but this is also very interesting chapter and uh, just to very quickly summarize so we know where chapter 4 stands so arjuna it started with arjuna's grief he got grief stricken and then we had discussed that the real grief only goes away when you realize who you are so so that's why krishna bhagwan gave him the highest knowledge in chapter 2 with many other things and then he told them that we are eternal and you know and you realize that who you are so the question was how to realize that just by somebody telling us and we knowing it intellectually doesn't happen it we have to experience it so he said how do i do that so then he brought the karma yoga in and then if you remember just to recollect what we learned there were five things uh, of uh, karma yoga that we learned that we need to do a uh, action in that mode that's what makes it karma yoga so it was samatvam buddhi swadharma buddhi samarpan buddhi asang buddhi and prasad buddhi and to make it in english equanimity of mind uh, knowing your duty you know what your correct duty is dedicating it to the higher that samarpan asang is non attachment doing it without attachment and prasad buddhi is when the results come we take it as a prasad from god and we don't say why this and all that that if we do it in that mode then we become fit to realize the self but then the question was why do we, why we are not able to do those things right so then krishna bhagwan came and said it's calm and krodha so it's desire and anger and you know they it's like a uh coin of same coin with two sides desire and anger that's what makes us not do our duty correctly and then how to take care of it don't come under the sway of likes and dislikes so he he said that you cannot get rid of likes and dislikes because we are born with certain tendencies and that becomes like our part of our that's part of our nature but once we determine what our duties are we should not move from our path so don't come or come under its sway that's what will make us do all those five things correctly and then the question comes okay bhagwan said dedicate this to god or higher self some people don't like the word god whatever you want to call it reality higher self consciousness you can give it your own name question is who is that who do i dedicate to if i and then we had mentioned that hey if i don't know who god is i don't know who to meditate upon i don't know who god is so slowly we will learn who god is it starts from here a touch of it and then it goes much in detail is going to come from chapter 7 to 12 but uh, and as you you will see that when krishna bhagwan is going to explain who god is as we will learn the true devotion will start now it's like okay somebody told me i should worship god and no, no, that's why we do it you know but so the true devotion starts once we come to know so um that's what we need to do and um now in chapter 
the question also will come besides uh, uh, who God is. Hey, how do I know what my duties are? What I should do and I should not do. All of us have that problem, right? That sometimes it's not clear. And, and that's how it started with Arjun. That he, uh, he, all of a sudden he realized in beginning of chapter, hey, I'm confused about my duty. On one hand, on one hand, I'm saying I want to run away from the war. On the other hand, I think maybe I should fight this war. So, uske, jase bolte na, ki dilemma ho gaya uske dimag mein. That dilemma we also go through every day with so many different aspects. So then to get the clarity, hey, what I should be doing and what I should not be doing, that's where chapter four comes in. It's going to tell us. And it's also going to reveal some more sadhana, we can call it you know, uh, certain practices in English, you can say that certain practices it is going to reveal, uh, we can call it upasana in that, you know, we can do certain things and the purpose of karma yoga and upasana, all of that is to purify the mind. That we have discussed many times. It's not like that kar- if you do karma yoga, karma yoga, is you know, that's going to take you. No, all it does is purify your mind and then, when you sit in meditation, then you realize the self. Basically, that's the whole process. Um, and uh, it also will tell, like, uh, Swamiji is going to explain in the commentary over here also in chapter 4, that like we discussed, the paths can be different. It can be karma yoga, it can be bhakti yoga, it can be jnana yoga, and then even Vivekananda said, you know, as many people, as many paths. So path may be all different, but the destination is the same. So everybody has to go through this knowledge. So by purifying your um, mind, by doing different sadhanas, whatever your mind is made up of, you purify and then your <clears throat> mind becomes pure and and um, clear and you understand who God is and all that. And that's when the self-realization happens. So um, importance of knowledge, it's going to tell you. It, it touches upon what knowledge is and what is the importance of it and how to achieve that knowledge. Because uh, when it comes to this kind of knowledge, it is not that somebody can show you, hey, this is what God is or this is how you realize. It is something you hear about it and that's why it's called Shruti also. Like there was a question, what is Shruti? It's the Vedas. You hear, you contemplate, and then you realize subjectively yourself. So it's a different kind of knowledge than what in the secular world that we learn about knowledge. So that's what it's going to be in, in chapter 4. And uh, so now we can go to the first verse. Oh, no, wait. We should uh, read the introduction. Renunciation of action. Okay, who's going to read that? Shireen? Yeah, you have to unmute yourself, Shireen. There's noise coming, I think. I don't know. Tell me if it disturbs you. Right now we are okay. Okay, all right. For the Aryan mind, novelty in the spiritual kingdom has no charm. Any new idea, however logical and intellectual it might be, is not readily accepted by the children of the Aryan culture as a part of their Brahma Vidya, unless the interpreter of the new idea can show that his technique has already been envisaged in the existing scriptures of this culture. In this way, we can say that we are Veda bound as a cultural unit. So here the word is Aryan mind. Okay, so Aryan is a, is a, a noble person. That's what the real meaning is of, of Aryan, a noble person. So we, we, we call it our Aryan culture in, in India. So he's just saying that we are very much into Veda bound culture, meaning everybody looking for Shastra Praman. That's called Shastra Praman means, you know, you, you need to give evidence from the Shastras because Shastras are the authorities accepted in that culture because it was verified by hundreds and hundreds of saints and sages as they came along it, it got, it's a verified knowledge it's not like hey, somebody cooked up some knowledge and all that so if, if the idea is here it's, he's calling it Swamiji is calling it a new idea and then later on he's going to explain 
that Krishna Bhagavan was not telling anything new. He was telling, you know, because the truth cannot be two different truths, right? He's giving the knowledge of the truth. It has to be the same, but he is correcting all the impurities that had come into it and uh, misunderstandings that had come into it. Because you saw that in Mahabharata time, when this was done, what kind of atrocities was happening, you know, and they all were saying, oh, I'm, I'm upholding dharma. Even Pandavas, you know, Yudhishthir also had an issue with gambling and things like that. And he, you know, gambled away his wife. So there were some problems and all misunderstanding what dharma is and all that. So that's what he's just saying that until somebody gives, you know, um, the technique, how this can be done, just theory is not going to do it here. That's, that's another point. Hmm. In the last chapter, Krishna propounded a re revolutionary idea in the form of karma yoga, which sounded as though it was a novel intellectual theory cooked in Krishna's own brain. Arjuna, as a true student of the Hindu culture, would not willingly accept it unless his teacher gave an endorsement that what he had lectured upon was nothing other than an intelligent reinterpretation of the ancient sacred Vedic science. In this chapter, an all-out effort is made by Krishna to bring home to Arjun that the Lord himself, the author of the Vedas, had been asserting the same old Vedic truth and nothing new. So, so here, uh, you know, Krishna had to go kind of all out over here to say who he is and it reminds me of because i attend so many, i have attended so many conferences with my husband you know or scientific conferences some of you in your own profession go some speaker comes the first thing they do is introduce who he is and the moment that the qualification list goes impressive everybody is like so attentive you know to listen so krishna has to <laughs> give neto wo to ami bol raha bas kuch bhi you know because wo thoda sa uska friend bhi tha he was same age from in the physical form so so here later on we will learn that how um, krishna bhagwan we cannot look at him when he's give, delivering the bhagavad gita we cannot look at him as a krishna as a body born in this earth he is merged with that consciousness he has become that consciousness and from that standpoint he's speaking you know, and, and, and well, even in your own professions and all that, there are moments that come to you when you are in totally in tune with what you want to do and, the, and everything comes out just perfect. And another time when you're trying to do it, it, it doesn't happen, you know. So here when he's delivering this Bhagavad Gita, the circumstances, the environment, the energy, the connection between the student and the, and the teacher, everything was so perfect that the consciousness is speaking okay so he has to but arjun doesn't know that yet when arjun surrendered to krishna bhagwan in chapter two it was not a complete surrender and in fact one of the swamis explained that he just said okay i'm ready to listen to you you know that kind of surrender it was because so far it was like i don't want to fight the war and krishna bhagwan said no you have to fight the war and they said okay I'm confused. You are. You seem to be very wise. I respect you. I want to, you know, I will listen to you what you want to say. Try to change my mind. That kind of attitude still is there. So, now, so that's why Krishna Bhagwan over here may have sensed that, okay, now it's the time that I tell him, what, you know, who I am. And then he will have a more, he will believe in him, you know. So it's like, like I said, he gave him the visiting card in this this one the true visiting card of krishna hmm. again whenever a teacher in his inspiration emphasizes a particular stage of self-development chances are that the dull-witted seekers may misunderstand the import of the words and conclude that the partial path explained is the entire route to the infinite in order to remove this misunderstanding the fourth chapter indicates the greater path of jnana yoga the path of knowledge which is the only main archway through which all pilgrims must pass in order to reach the temple of the self 
up to this archway seekers living in different psychological and intellectual domains may walk their own paths but the main gate is gyana yoga through which all must pass to have darshan at the glorious altar according to shankara this yoga alone forms the subject of the lord's teachings throughout the gita so here he is emphasizing the the final knowledge the all the because what he's saying is that you know people get if you don't understand the gita completely and you just read in bits and pieces it it can become a little dangerous thing because you'll get stuck at, oh bas karma yoga karo but uska matlab hi nahi malum ki be karma yoga purify of mind ke liye kiya jata hai ye nahi ki usse tumko bhagwan mil jayega but it's absolutely necessary for people who have too many desires too much attachment there is no other path you know because they won't be able to move uh, and and the best example i can give is uh, like some one of the swami said it so nicely he said somebody says hey um do i do i take the entrance exam or do i go to college hello entrance exam is to get to college <laughs> okay so karma yoga is like to get to to gyana yoga so that's what so he's saying that everybody no matter whether you follow karma yoga bhakti yoga or gyana yoga predominantly something or or a mixture of all three or whichever you have to gain the knowledge without that it's not going to happen so that's why he made it so beautifully you know example that through the archway of of knowledge everybody has to pass through so but as your mind gets purified with your own sadhana the knowledge will dawn upon us as we we that's the whole idea hmm. a secular science can be successfully taught and ingrained on the gray matter of the student by any teacher it is not at all necessary that the student must have any love for or faith in or reverence towards the teacher who in such a case is nothing more than an instrument of instruction thus today a professor in a modern college is only a talking instrument with as much importance as the blackboard or the desk or the platform but on the other hand if a cultural flavor a moral dignity and an ethical glow are to be imparted to the personality of the student it is essential that the student must approach his teacher in a spirit of reverence and love devotion and friendliness these are the emotional requirements which alone can bring about the necessary conditions in us so that when the teacher drops his divine apparel it may fall upon our shoulders over yeah swami ji uses <laughs> very kind of poetic language very nice very beautiful very beautiful so he's just saying that how the secular world you know we all know we have gone to college and all that and i remember when i went to my first year of college i was just horrified that how there was no reverence for the teacher you know some rebellious students were there and it, this was supposed to be the best college of commerce in mumbai you know I mean, when the nice from Sydney College was number one, and I'm like, there were two hundred students, and the professor just came, and and nobody was interested. Half of them walked out, and he just said whatever he wanted to, and he left. उसको भी कोई interest नहीं था कि हमको कुछ सिखाए वो. So कोई अच्छा गुरु भी मिल जाता है तो it is so amazing. And then there were this was one professor only, yeah, this one guy. Another guy was very good, like the way he tried to connect to students, and then everybody wanted to listen. And so there were few. Everybody's favorite professor. They would go to the class. Other they would bunk it, and then they would say, "Oh, I'll study on my own," because they were not taking attendance and all that. It was just bad. That's what they are saying. But in in when it comes to these kind of spiritual thing, that the head and heart both have to connect. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. That's what basically, and we know, you know that. unless you have because this is much it's a subjective experience and it's the highest knowledge so that's why you need all of this you know what he's talking about in this to arjuna lord krishna was only a friend the cohort boy of vrindavan family familiarity if it does not breed contempt is at least sure to pull down the familiar in a estimation of his importance and sanctity This chapter is also intended to invoke in Arjun's mind the necessary amount of reverence and respect towards his charioteer. 
In short, Krishna is here divesting himself of his work day clothes and is putting on for the first time his full divine apparel of omnipotence and omniscience and the aura of God descended upon the earth. So we already discussed that, you know, how Krishna Bhagwan was his friend and relative, but here he, he puts on this, you know, divine apparel because he tells him who he is. Hmm. And, and Arjuna is not going to believe 100%. He has, he's going to have a doubt. So which is uh, okay because it's like Lord gave him the opportunity to ask questions and then he explained to him that what it, and then through Arjun, we are going to learn. In fact, it's kind of interesting that I, I was listening to some some, uh, some discourse on, on this and they said even one theory is that, that Arjun purposely asked that question because he knew that other people are going to have it. So he did it for us. <laughs> but that's just one theory. Whatever it is, whichever one you want to believe is fine. But Arjun had a doubt. Hmm. Through an earlier training in Karma Yoga, when an individual has integrated his mind and intellect, he becomes fit for the absorption and assimilation of the greater truth through the process of contemplation and meditation. Therefore, there is a strong recommendation of the path of knowledge in this chapter. So, you know, you can see that there is a complete logic in Bhagavad Gita because finish the chapter 3, which is Karma Yoga, explain him everything and Karma Yoga is supposed to make your mind pure. So now you're ready for further. That's why we are going deeper into all the sadhanas and you know all everything in chapter four. So that's how it is. So this is the introduction by Swamiji. And now we'll go to the verse. I'm gonna chant whoever has the verse can see it. Om Shri Paramatmane Namaha Ata Chaturtha Chaturtho Dhyayaha Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Imam Vivasvate Yogam Proktavahanam Avyayam Vivasvan Manave Praha Manurikshvaka Vebravit Imam is this Vivasvate Vivasvan and this is a pretty loaded word and we are going to learn what it is. Yogam is yoga. Proktavan is taught. Aham I and here, when, you, when Aham, Krishna Bhagavan is saying, is that consciousness talking. Okay? Avyayam, imperishable. Vivaswan is, uh, again, that same Vivaswan. It's Lord Sun, but there is a very, very deep meaning that we will learn. Manve is to Manu. Manu in, and Shatrupa are supposed to be like Adam and Eve in the Western world. The first man. Okay, Manu. Praha is taught. Manu is again Manu. Ishwakave. Ishwaku. And that also we're going to learn this word, what it is, because it has a lot of deep meaning. Ishwaku was the son of, eldest son of Manu. And it was the same dynasty like Ram Bhagwan. That's why it's called Ishwaku Vanshka Bolte. So, Abravit is taught. So what he's telling over here in this particular verse, Krishna Bhagwan is declaring that the yoga that I've been talking about, and he's talking about, he didn't even mention different yogas now. He said the one word yoga, because everything comes under that. You know, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, everything comes. You know, if you, Raja Yoga, bol do, Dhyana Yoga, jo bhi bolna hai. All that comes under this that the yoga that, that I've been talking about, I taught that to Vivaswan. Um, and Vivaswan taught to Manu and Manu taught to Ishwaku. So, so Vivaswan, on one hand, it is the sun. Now we have to kind of uh, understand what this Vivaswan in, in there are two, two meanings. One is just the, the physical meaning of it, which is also valid. And then there is a spiritual, adhyatmic meaning, the, the deep meaning. So you will see that. And it, there's a lot of science in there too. But everybody scientifically also know that, you know, sun came first and then came the earth. Right? Nine planets came out of the sun. We all know that. So sun is the first one. And, and uh, sun, through sun, 
everything is happening in this world. We have discussed that. Without sun, we are nothing. We are like, you know, our life and everything on this earth depends upon the sun. And now if you go beyond the sun, okay, where did the sun come from? Scientifically, you can say, you know, there were some big two galaxies collided, whatever you want to say with, through all those shows that they do and, and the scientific evidence also. But uh, spiritually speaking, where is everything coming from? Is coming from their consciousness. So obviously the consciousness gave the information to the sun and from sun, it has come trickled down to us. So physically speaking also, it makes a complete sense. Okay. Now the question is that, that what, what is Vivaswan now? Meaning of Vivaswan. So the Sanskrit meaning of Vivaswan is Vasa. Vasa means to live. To live very well in everybody. So, so the essence of sun is in everyone. That's one physical way. And the other way is, there is a, there is a word uh, in, in Vedanta called Hiranyagarbha. Anybody has heard of that word, Hiranyagarbha? Okay, Meena ji has heard. So. I know this, Hiranyagarbha is like a cosmic intelligence, uh, the combined intelligence of the whole cosmos together. That's called Hiranyagarbha. Okay. So in English, we can say that there is a cosmic intelligence that exists in the universe because it is a cosmos. It is not a chaos. You know, from, from certain angles, somebody can say, oh, it looks chaotic. No, there is nothing chaotic about it. it there is a physical, physics law, chemistry law. Everything is working. And, and so that cosmic intelligence comes from the consciousness, comes to the sun first. And from sun, it comes in us. Where does it come in us? It comes in our minds. Because a human is all, that's why when they say Manu, Manu was the first human. What is a human meaning? Through the, even if you believe in evolution theory, fine. Okay. And the evolution, Hua, then the man came. What is the difference between the human and the other species? We all know it is our mind. We have a tremendous capacity in our mind to, to do hundreds of other tasks that other people, other species don't do. We can, you know, we can analyze, we can um, come up with new things, we can communicate, you know, and, and um, contemplate, judge, compare, predict, God knows hundreds of things we can do. Where is that coming from? It's coming from that cosmic intelligence. Because we have, in our arrogance, we might think, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so this, but where is it coming from? <laughs> you know, it is coming from that cosmic intelligence. And the path of that cosmic intelligence is, um, you know, from that higher self, from the consciousness to the sun, to, and then uske baad unhone kya bola? it was given to Ishwaku, correct? What is the meaning of Ishwaku? So Ish, Ish, uh, uh, sorry, kya na mein uska? Ishwaku. Ik, ikshu, Ikshu means eyes. Okay. Eyes. Eyes. Aake. And oh. yeah, eyes. And then vak means to speak. So when this cosmic intelligence comes in our mind, through our mind, it trickles down to senses. And, and you know, we are able to see, we are able to, and then vak is, is uh, when we speak. So when we, remember we talked about panchendriya, I mean, gyanendriya and karmendriya, right? We have five uh, sense uh, perception organs, you know, like all these uh, seeing and hearing and touching and all that. And then five action uh, organs of action. So the eyes represent all those five. Because remember, in Veda, there's a coded language. They don't talk about everything openly. It is a, because there's not much time. It's an all in a sutra form. So we have, that's why we need some, you know, teachers and all to kind it's of. It's also the other spiritual eye. Huh? Sorry? It's also the spiritual eye. Yeah, yeah. So that remember, we are going through both the path, the physical and the spiritual. So uh, ikshu is the, is the eyes, and then vak is the speech. So it trickles down. So basically, the cosmic intelligence coming from that higher self through that path 
uh, expresses through our walk and our eyes, means through our senses and all that. So it's extremely scientific. There is nothing like Mangaranth over here. So um, that's how this knowledge came. So um, basically what happens is that if the mind is quiet and balanced, this cosmic intelligence, it comes through the best. And that's why if somebody wants to do some job, even in the physical world, okay, we have to quieten our mind. We have to withdraw from the rest of the things and we have to focus on what we are doing. We are, so spiritual world is the same way, you know. Um, and another very, very important thing that this, this brings out, that the knowledge that we get, we are not the creator of it. In our own arrogance, we think that no, we are not. We are receiver of that knowledge. That suddenly puts the shift in our mind. And as you can see, um, you know, like in the scientific, scientific world, this happens a lot because since I'm married to a scientist, I know this. When they start an, some new project, okay, experiment, and they are, you know, in, in the scientific world, there's a big race going on. I want to be the first one to discover this and all that. And when they discover, they find out three other people in the three other corners of the world were doing exactly the same thing, you know? And I'm sure in your own professions also, if you are in R&D and all that, maybe that happens. And then there is a big fight among themselves, you know, who was the first, this, that. But Vedant is saying something totally different because they, it just so happened that five different people in five different corners of the world had the quiet mind and the sadhana they were doing with whatever subject from higher self that knowledge came through them and all these rishi munis and all that that's how they even even uh, declared all the vedic shlokas and all that it came in their meditation it came through them that's how it is. And then here, there are some poets here and all that. When, when you are inspired suddenly and you, you certain um, waves are correct in your mind, it just comes out, the poetry. Later on, you will try, you know, it may not do happen. So that's what it is. So we are the receiver of it. And one of the very simple example is, you know, some kind of radio or a TV. When we tune to a particular channel, the information starts flowing through. So in cosmic intelligence, from that Iranyagarbha, call it cosmic intelligence, that's how it happens. And scientifically speaking, that same cosmic intelligence in all the uh, inert things also. It's not just us, okay? Or uh, partially alive things. For example, um, vegetations out there. Seed. If I hold a seed in my hand, that seed has a complete cosmic intelligence of so many things. The seed knows how to produce a whole tree. That's called that cosmic intelligence. So that's kind of contemplation we have to do, that it knows how to create the leaf and the trunk and the fruit and the flowers and perpetuate by creating more seeds. Can, can you imagine the kind of information that has? Where is that coming from? Cosmic intelligence. And then the dirt also has its own cosmic intelligence. And that's why, you know, like there's a connection between the dirt and the seed that happens and all the nutrients get pulled from the earth and all that, all that is part of that cosmic intelligence. So we cannot deny that, you know. So it is in all the animals, all the, and humans, it expresses even more advanced, as I told you, for, for different reasons. So um, this is, even though this verse looks very, very simple, but it has a lot of spiritual information in this. Before we read Swamiji's uh, commentaries, any question on this? Yeah, Vandana. Unmute. Yeah, go ahead. Auntie, can you, this loaded um, sentence that you said, Ekshu, can you... When you write your, uh, can you write it down the two, three stanzas in Sanskrit? Because oh, you mean the word Ishwaku yeah. and all that? Yeah. yeah. And I would highly uh, recommend people to now, uh, if you are if you are going to continue to uh, attend this class, get the uh, Bhagavad Gita book of Swamiji. 
that will because all of this is already there in it you know the verses are there this is from the verse ishwaku the word yeah the but, original sanskrit it's yeah. a very key phrase it is you know? yes yes and that's why it is so you know the more we learn about it we realize how much science is in there even small small words you a whole commentary you can write which is which is just absolutely incredible true true Thank any you. other any other question okay who wants to read uh, the verse one swamiji's commentary Shireen, you, you have to mute yourself, Shireen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Sushil ji, Meena ji, Anil ji, one of you. Sushil I ji. can read ah. it. Maybe it's from the old book, but it might be the same. I can read it. See okay, you works. can. Let's try and then we'll see. Meena, yeah. Meena ji, you have the new one? So, if. if yes, okay. Yeah. So, Sushil ji can start, and if something is missing, you can. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. As we said in our introduction to this chapter, the Lord is making an open statement that what he had been saying so far was not. Oh, sorry. Other... Um, can you can you read the English translation first of the verse? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I taught this imperishable yoga to Vivas, Vivaswan. Vivaswan taught it to Manu and Manu taught it to Ikshivaku. As we said in our introduction to this chapter, the Lord is making an open statement that what he had been saying so far was nothing other than an intelligent reiteration of what is the content of the immortal Vedas. Inspired by a divine remembrance, the Lord declares that he himself, at the very beginning of creation, imparted the knowledge of the Vedas to the sun, and later on, the sun god conveyed it to his son, Manu, the ancient Lord giver of India. Manu, in his turn, declared it to Ikshavaku, and ancestor of the solar dynasty who ruled over Ayodhya for a long period of time. The word Veda is derived from the root with okay i think so, already one is missing now one paragraph is missing i think meena ji will have to take over okay uh, mm. yeah mm. the idea that the vedas are eternal is indeed a hard truth for easy digestion for all especially for a modern student but this difficulty comes mainly because we know that the Pamario leaves of the Vedic books are finite material. The moment we hear the term Veda, we are apt to identify it with a textbook entitled the Vedas. In this case of the term, as mere book of Vedas, it is indeed finite and perishable. Okay, this he said it because here uh, Krishna Bhagwan said that I taught this imperishable yoga, he called it. So what it means, we have to understand this because it's talking about the consciousness which is itself imperishable. So its knowledge be imperishable ho gaya ki nahi? You know, that's what the logic is. But if we look at the Vedas, because one of the problems that even these academic people have, Baba, is, uh, you know, because I attended some of their lectures, they drive you crazy because they try to put a date on it. But, Kab likha gaya tha? Oh my God. It's in, in, in uh, Vedanta, it's called uh, eternal. And, and, and Swamiji explained the best way. Can you say that when, when did the law of physics started? Hey, when the, when the whole universe began, that's when. How can you put a date on it? Same way, when you say Vedas, it's just the laws and knowledge of this entire cosmos. It has to be there when it started. And it is a cyclic thing. So, so even... The cycle is mentioned in the Veda. Okay? That's how eternal it is. That even when this universe is not going to be there, those laws are still going to be there when the next one comes. You see what I'm saying? How it is, is once you know, once you believe in it, it's eternal. There is no question. We don't need to put a date on it at all. We are fools if we put dates on it. But the same knowledge to different aspects of it have been 
uh, revealed to different Rishi Munis in their meditation or when they become the right Patra. The same way when all of you, you, are, you have certain knowledge that you acquired because you made your mind quiet, you made, you know, even for to go to college and all and to pass our exam, we have to do that. You know, we have to, so it's the same process in the spiritual world also. It's a little more intense, you know. That's also that's why it's called imperishable. So we should understand why it is called imperishable. And I think Swamiji is absolutely the master of trying to explain it correctly. So that we actually believe in it. And otherwise, you know, every bolding ke, what is eternal, we don't understand, then it's not gonna stick with us. But now once we analyze it, why it is eternal, it's gonna stick with us now. Go ahead, Meena Ji. You want me to say or okay. okay. Yeah, continue. Yeah. The word Veda is derived from the root vid to know. Veda therefore means knowledge, the knowledge of divinity lurking in man and the technique by which it can be brought out to full manifestation are the theme of Veda textbooks and the truth of this theme is eternal. So here it is. And Veda is to know and it means knowledge. And, and you know, like if, if that divine spark is within us, Entire knowledge is also in within us, but we, whatever knowledge is just capable of sadhana karte hain, wo hamare andar phut hai. That's a, that's another way you can look at it. Everybody is capable, but it depends. You know, we are in this limited body, and you know our our sadhanas can be limited. But if any of you watch that those ND shows, all of them said the moment they dropped the body and they were in that, the knowledge dawned upon them. Of there are so many things, you know, they felt one with the knowledge, you know, and it is not a physical way of knowing it. It is just uh, almost telepathic way. They don't have the right words to describe it, but you just know it. And then, you know, another problem that it is in the, because of the Western way of learning is, we give so much importance to just one way of learning. But there are other ways to learn too. And, and sometimes the uh, transfer of knowledge can happen differently also. You know, like uh, we, we may not believe in it, but through eyes people have, you know, all these people who are in the Himalayas and all that, I've heard that that's how they, they do that. And, and one of them was saying that, you know, some people have these Siddhis um, you know, extra power to grasp things. They might look at a leaf and they have the information of what the leaf is all about. It sounds bizarre to us, but there are people like that also. That, that another way of transferring because if we believe that the that entire knowledge is 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 everywhere, then it can come through any any means. But because we are we are kind of stuck on one way of just learning, you know, that's why we have this limited way of thinking. But if you expand your mind, you can see. And we know that sometimes some children are born uh, with, a, with a knack for certain things. They don't need to learn that anywhere. And it, it is very evident in the, in the fine arts, like music or, or uh, art and all that. You know, so they're already bringing that knowledge. From, from the past lives and all that. So that's another way that people bring knowledge. It's not, doesn't have to be that you have to learn only over here. So we have to contemplate upon those kind of aspects. Hmm. Go ahead. Just as we can say that electricity is eternal, as there was electricity even before the first scientist discovered it, and the electrical energy will not be exhausted because of our forgetfulness of its existence, so too the divine nature of man will never be destroyed because of our non-assertion of it. The knowledge of the divine content and its possibilities in man are indeed eternal. He gave a beautiful example yeah. of elect and, and all these um, things that we are dealing with it now, uh, it has made our life all easy. We are doing all these Zoom and this and that. All that technology is always there, right? Somebody just discovered it. That's why they call it discovery. They never call it somebody created it. It's already there. They just discovered it now. That's all it is. So it's eternal, all these things. The creation of the universe, it is accepted even by modern science, must have started with the sun. As the source of all energy, the sun was the first of the created objects 
And with its very creation, this great knowledge of the self was given out to the world. So we discussed all that in detail. Huh? There are some commentators who read into this stanza a limited meaning and claim that the yoga taught by Lord was the yoga of equanimity, which synthesizes Sankhya yoga and Karma yoga. Indeed, the cosmic forces represented by the sun, no doubt instinctively, live the life of perfect karma yogins inasmuch as their life is continuous exertion in the spirit of yajna, which we had explained in the previous chapter. So he's just talking about that, how the forces of nature work in a perfect karma yoga attitude. And we have to get inspiration from that. So some people just go. So there are, as I was saying that, all these verses there are so many different aspects of the meaning mm -hmm. and you know you have to just try to understand it from every angle and slowly it dawns upon it what they are saying hmm. you know it's the sacrificial way of doing it that's what they expect the, the nature does it in the sacrifice yes. and that's what we have to learn yes so exactly mm -hmm. it is very interesting sorry go ahead oh i i thought you were finishing um you know scientifically we say that there is more than one sun. There are actually many suns. 